Thank you. This ex extremely late breaking trial. Uh, the series that uh, we, are, we are talking about, the trial we're talking about, is a first in human trial of a new thoracic stent craft called the Mona LSA device. It's a branch thoracic stent craft. And it's part of the early feasibility device trial in the FDA's new innovation pathway. Disclosures are shown in this slide. The device is from Medtronic. I serve as a consultant with them. We know that the left subclavian artery requires coverage during thoracic endovascular aortic repair in as, uh, as many as 43% of patients. And it's not a benign procedure. In a recent analysis of over 1,000 cases of left subclavian uh, uh, coverage or left subclavian management during TVAR, the group from St. George's Hospital and the group from Penn showed us that it was the single most important predictor of stroke during thoracic endovascular aortic repair. And we know from some other data that covering the left subclavian artery can contribute to spinal cord ischemia, arm ischemia, and potentially death. In response to this, a new device has been developed that has built into it a branch for the left subclavian artery. This is the Valiant Mona LSA stent graft system. It's based on the Valiant thoracic stent graft system, comes in diameters currently between 30 and 46 millimeters, and it's a length of 15 centimeters long. This device has uh, the branch built onto it is a volcano. You can see this uh, uh, with a volcano type arrangement. It's flexible uh, right at the base of the proximal end of the thoracic stent graft. Uh, it, the system is a two wire system with a preloaded wire into that volcano. Uh, and it's based on the um, current Valiant system with a tip capture. The branch that goes into the left subclavian artery is a novel device. It's a nitinol helical stent with a distal flare that allows it to mate to the main uh, stent graft, the main body of the stent graft. Comes in sizes between 10 and 14 millimeters, and it's a standard 40 millimeter length. The delivery system for that is a 15 French profile delivery system, and also delivered through femoral access. What's been really exciting about this uh, trial is not only this new device, but it's part of the innovation pathway through the FDA. With guidance from the Centers for um, uh, Radiology and Devices, this new program allows us to bring first in world technology to the United States. Uh, and it's uh, set up so that we can do clinical investigation, usually of a small number of subjects, for new devices to provide proof of principle and gather initial clinical safety data. I'm going to get on to the, uh, the series and the device itself. Uh, right now, the trial is set up to enroll seven subjects at two sites. We've done three of these so far, and it's uh, all occurred within uh, the last three weeks. The goal is to validate that this procedure can be done safely in humans, to assess the safety over a 30-day window, and to learn uh, about uh, the uh, disease process and how to uh, better uh, develop this device. This patient was a 70-year-old. This was my patient. She had a descending aneurysm measuring 55 millimeters with a proximal seal zone between the left subclavian and the left common carotid artery uh, of uh, 21 millimeters long and a distal landing zone just above the celiac artery. The left subclavian artery was an average size. And so we plan to treat this patient with the uh, branch stent graft system proximally and two distal extensions bringing the repair right down to the celiac artery. This is a preoperative CT. What you don't get uh, in this image is the thrombus and the aneurysm, but up uh, in the very proximal descending aorta is where the aneurysm is largest. And we have a landing zone across that distal aortic arch, which required coverage of the left subclavian artery. And so in our hybrid suite, we get access through unilateral exposure of the right femoral artery, and then percutane, I'm not in two places at once, uh, and then left uh, access into the left brachial artery using a micropuncture system, and we upsize to a seven French system into the left subclavian artery. Uh, this is a video of the procedure. So uh, that's the angiogram. The device is uh, parked with the preloaded wire into the descending aorta. And with a snare coming from that left brachial 7 French sheath, we snare that preloaded wire. Uh, you can see it being snared and now pulled back into the sheath that's in the left uh, brachial access. Once we get that through and through wire access, 
uh, from below. We've now got our stent graft system with the double wire uh, system. The device is advanced up into the arch and uh, what you see here is that the wire is actually wrapped around the tip. I was able to unwrap that wire from the tip and now we see what we want to see where we have wire separation. We then rotate the uh, C-arm uh, in the operating room to confirm that we have proper uh, alignment of these two wires. Again, one is a through and through wire from left brachial coming out the side of the delivery system. The other is a stiff wire in the ascending aorta. The device is then unsheathed in a standard fashion by unwinding the valiant delivery system. The first couple of stents are exposed and you can see that our preloaded wire is coming right through that volcano uh, type uh, uh, branch at the top. There is a wire at the top of that volcano which constricts the size of that volcano to eight millimeters and a larger uh, wire at the base of it. We then do the tip capture release and, uh, and deliver the distal stent graft into the uh, descending aorta. This was done by just exchanging the um, system over that through and through wire. Once that more distal device was deployed, and I did that because I didn't want the device sitting um, floating inside the aneurysm distally, so we deployed one of the distal extensions uh, before delivering the left subclavian branch. The left subclavian branch is then delivered over that through and through wire, again exchanging through the groin. Uh, that was done with this 15 French delivery system that has the branch in it, uh, but it was delivered through a 20 French uh, check flow sheath. That's a self-expanding stent that we uh, are careful to deploy slowly here. And the back end of the stent is flared and secured within that volcano. Our initial aortogram showed a type 1 endo leak. We weren't really thrilled about that, but we know how to handle that. We haven't ballooned this device yet. And so what we did was we put in a, a, a 12 millimeter by 4 centimeter balloon into the left subclavian artery and then a uh, reliant balloon into the aorta and dilated our seal zone or uh, conformed our seal zone to the aorta both right across the very proximal segment and then right across the distal end of the seal zone where the aorta takes a turn. Despite this being uh, a very tight gothic type arch we had no problem getting this device in place and now our completion angiogram shows an excellent result. This is the completion angiogram showing no evidence of uh, type 1 or 3 endo leaks with our repair going right down to the celiac artery. The other two patients were very similar. Uh, these were done at the Carolinas Heart Institute. Again, the main branch of the device was delivered on this uh, two-wire system, expanded just as you saw the other device uh, quite easily, has the cone pop open there right at the base of the left subclavian artery right in this region here. And by having that through and through wire in place and maintaining tension on that through and through wire, it helps to align the branch of the left subclavian artery uh, very well with the artery. And uh, with this volcano-like system, uh, there's a little bit of margin for uh, the potential that it may be off by a few degrees, although we haven't seen that be an issue at all in any of the animal implants uh, or in these three patients so far and then the um, uh, branch graft is delivered into the left subclavian artery, uh, self-expanded, and it's uh, easily mated to that main body system with a flaring of the very bottom of that stent. Uh, both uh, Frank Arco and I have done these procedures, and you see this. We're, we're slow with the deployment of this branch graft. We want to make sure it doesn't jump or move on us. Um, because I think it's uh, important to have that precisely you know, deployed. Here's the completion angiogram, shows a great repair. This third patient, I won't spend a lot of time on the video, but this was a patient with large penetrating ulcer uh, just beyond the level of the left subclavian artery, and, this, and the uh, videos are going to be uh, just as what you saw in the other two, simple delivery of the stent graft uh, with that uh, caveat that we have to snare the wire and get through and through wire access. We got an excellent deployment. This patient only needed a single device to cover that penetrating aortic ulcer. So in conclusion, 
I think as we've uh, uh, learned a lot and evolved in the treatment of thoracic endovascular aortic repair, we need to have better disease-specific devices. Fortunately, through this new FDA innovation pathway, I hope to see the rapid development and approval process being deployed for more novel devices in the U.S. This, uh, is, this uh, process is now underway, and we've shown uh, so far that left subclavian artery preservation during TVAR with the Mona Lisa system has been feasible. Thank you very much. Is there any discussion from the floor? Eric, I think this is a, um, an interesting advance, and obviously it's not an essential thing to do, but it, 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 if it can save you having to do the uh, uh, left subclavian bypass, that's, that's good, less surgery. What, um, do you have any insight from the company if they're going to charge us double for this graft? <laughs> uh, you'll have to ask them. <laughs> I'm um, sure they are. I, I imagine there will be a, a premium for it. <laughs> Uh, but I don't think you can discount the, the morbidity associated with the left sub, uh, chronic subclavian bypass. I mean, uh, um, there are a lot of nerves in the base of the neck. Um, I had a patient recently who came in with a large penetrating ulcer in her, in her distal arch uh, who is a lady that's had a permanent tracheostomy for 12 years. She's not going to die despite having had this uh, airway injury, but I sure as heck don't want to put any prosthetic material in her neck. I couldn't get her into the inclusion criteria on this, and I've made my own device for her so I can avoid a chronic subclavian bypass. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but there's plenty of other folks uh, who, who are high-risk patients with uh, thoracic disease, and I think uh, not only uh, does it allow us to you know, avoid one additional operation in these patients, but it also may serve as a platform to see more disease-specific devices. Thoracic branch devices are going to continue uh, uh, to be developed and move more proximally in the aorta, and uh, I think this is a beginning of, of uh, uh, that sort of potential. Uh, Turkey Al Bakr from Saudi Arabia. Uh, Eric, this, this is a great in innovation, and uh, I'd like to thank you for um, helping to develop such technology. Uh, my question is regarding the design of the device. You know the. There's two types of, of device we can use, either the fenestrated or the branched one. And usually we use the branched devices if there's a large aneurysm in which you want to bridge the gap between the uh, main stent and the branch. Uh, why did you um, or the company decide to go with the branched uh, design instead of go going for the fenestration? Because the distance between the main stent and the branch is, is, the, is very short. Or you can use a fenestrated device where it's usually easier to cannulate the branch instead of having all the uh, issues with the patency of the branch crafts? Well, um, although this, I guess, technically, you know, it's right now we don't really know exactly what the definition is between branch and fenestrated, but, but I would say that this is uh, um, more a branch device because there is a separate system there uh, to attach the, the stent. <coughs> and one of the issues in the aortic arch, in, in the proximal thoracic aorta in general, is there's a lot of force and a lot of motion on the devices. And the, and the aorta, uh, not only cardiac motion, but respiratory motion. And one of the concerns with just making a fenestration in a device and sticking, uh, for example, a, a balloon expandable stent is, is the forces on the devices themselves. Uh, in testing models, uh, using commercially available devices in, in a similar manner, uh, uh, it's, it's pretty common to see those devices fracture. And so this system is specifically designed uh, with durability in mind. And uh, um, so the, uh, uh, the engineers that helped to design this uh, ha have done a really great job uh, of assessing the safety of it uh, uh, in vitro uh, to, to look at durability testing. And in, and in the process of gathering imaging on these patients, we hope to do further analysis of it as well. And that's, that's the, uh, the real beauty of having this uh, early feasibility pathway uh, the clinicians that are involved with these kind of procedures here in the U.S. Uh, are also able to participate in some of that sort of developmental process and analysis of, uh, of what's happening. All right, thanks. Thanks, Eric, for bringing that new material to thanks. us. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to present it. Thanks, everyone, for coming.